Alright, alright, fine. I'll be a gracious host. How you doing? Little Mermaid is the scariest Disney movie by far, though. Why the hell is Ace Blade in your Kickstarter? <laughs> Some comics. We going I'm getting controversial today. We're gonna get controversial today with with my my proudest moment is this interview and being able to talk to you too. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Taurus Comics, in collaboration with Fourth Wall Productions, respectfully, brings to you the 79th episode of the Four Tales podcast. I am your host, Kyron Silva from Taurus Comics. Across the way is the pomegranate playwriter of Ace Blade, Danny J. Quick, and together we are your two award-winning Blurred Comic Creators, here to help you find your next favorite comic. We are live on the Age of Geekdom Network via Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. So if you are listening or watching us live, thank you for your support. But don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and review this podcast because all your positive reviews and interactions help us reach a bigger audience. And if you want to financially support us, you can go to our website, buy us some merchandise, buy us coffee. Or if you're a gamer, you can go to w.gg, use our code 4 tails, that's the number 4, T-A-L-E-S, and get 10% off your order. There you go. Danny J. Quick, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I like that yeah. little addition to the intro there, sir. Which which one? I have a lot now. All of it. Okay. All of it, <laughs> All of it especially. Uh, I don't know if people could tell, but we got our first sponsor uh, for the Four Tales podcast, and um, I'm excited about it. So yeah. I'm actually about to go. Can I use our own discount? Can I use our own code? Yes, you can. Right, okay, that's yes, what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> All right. Um, how you been doing, man? I'm doing all right. Uh, Javon's in the building. Good morning, Javon. Mm-hmm. I know I saw Fish Lee earlier was uh, asking some questions. So good morning, Fish. But I'm all right. I'm all right. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I'm tired, I'm though. Tired. See? Come on now. I'm tired. Come on now with the yawning. All right. You've been okay. reading any comic books lately? I have. And yeah. I am disappointed in myself. I have not read this book earlier. But I started reading uh, for Father's Day. I got the uh, Tom Taylor Nightwing series. Oh. And I'm a big Nightwing fan just in general. And I don't know why I did not buy this earlier, but it is freaking fantastic, dude. Now I'm going to have to check up. Is it in trade yet? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Definitely, definitely going to have to check that out. I, I'm, yeah. not a, I'm not as huge a fan of Nightwing as... As as some, but um, I I like Nightwing. I can I can I can get one Nightwing. Okay, who's your favorite Batman family character? That's not Batman. Um, I like Damien. I'm okay. I'm a Damien Wayne guy. I like the attitude. I I like Damien. All right, that, um, that, that that actually that fits for you for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, dude. That fits a lot for you. Now that now that I know you, that fits pretty well. Yeah, I like the attitude. And Javon is right. Danny has no taste, which is, you know, that's we you all do that by now. We don't all have to like the same things as our as our esteemed de- guest today will will probably tell us. Um, but um, I've been reading some some indie stuff. I got uh, last weekend. I was at Heroes Con in Charlotte, North Carolina. I picked up this book called Derelicts, okay. which is um, which is a pretty good looking book by Glenn Urieta and then uh, The Revagent by our. Our guest last week, Daryl Murphy, which uh, I, I do want to say, great job on that interview. Um, I know that was your first interview, yeah, when you know in person like that. So that was a good job, man. I was nervous, but um, it was it was fun. So, uh, okay. got to do more on location stuff like that. Definitely. Well, let's uh, let's uh let's bring our guest on, and because I'm now I am I am really want to find out who his favorite non Batman Bat family. Yeah, uh, person. Yeah. So, so let's bring him on. Uh, we have the amazing Ron Mars on the show today. Uh, writer for Marvel, DC, uh, God, Cross Gen, uh, Star Wars. Wars. I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if it, if there's been a comic company that's not my own comic company, he's probably written for it at this point. So, I think <laughs> I think uh, I heard him say one time that the only comic book company he hasn't wrote for it was uh, Boom at the time, Boom Studios, maybe. Uh, is that still the case, Mr. Mars? That's still true. Still true. Yeah. Okay. So, how do we get you on Boom Studios at this point? Uh, I, I think you have 
invent more hours in the day is, okay. uh, is really what, what we need to do. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good Hi, morning. Trevor. Thank you. Thank you for being on. Um, I, I, I do want to start off with, with probably the most important question that you're going to hear from us today. Because uh, you, you've been doing comics for a long time, and I need to know, what is it like working with my best friend, Ron Lim? Like, what, what is that like? Um, and at the current time, it's like uh, going back home again, because he was, you know, he was the guy that I worked with first in my career. First artist that ever set uh, pencil to paper for one of my scripts. Oh, wow. um, I love that. Uh, so, uh, he's just the happiest guy in the world. He's, you know, he really is. <laughs> he's such a, he's such a charming, happy dude. Um, uh, and, but, and creatively. So, you know, we're, we're buddies. That's, that helps, you know, that's a big part of it. But, um, creatively, he's just, um, he's just such a solid storyteller and professional that I know whatever I give him is going to come back looking amazing um and looking like looking like a comic book should look you know um it's very much um it's it's very much a uh, a partnership i trust him he trusts me um it's still a you know it's still a delight whenever his pages show up in my inbox like they did this week i love it that's a that's a underrated part of the the creation journey when you are working with somebody that you uh that you can trust to to do the things <laughs> the way that they're supposed to be done or you know or their way that which is which fits the job i know yeah it's 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 not even the way that they're supposed to be done it's just you know um i always like in a uh um uh, a creative team writer penciler inker or just artist colorist letterer editor um to a basketball team mm -hmm. or a jazz uh quartet or quintet where everybody does what they do they do their thing you know um the uh, the bass player um and the and the drummer and the saxophone player are all doing a different thing but the different thing that they do all goes into the um uh, all goes into the the same thing that they're you know the same package the same project right. uh, so um, when you when you trust the person that's next to you doing their thing, um, this is magic. This is you know that's where the alchemy of all this comes in. Um, so um, so yeah, trust is great, but also just you know you do the thing that you do, and I'll stand here and watch you. You know, and and then at the end of it, we're all pulling together to make the same thing. It's a it's a tremendous. Um, I don't think you get that sort of sense of collaboration out of anything else creatively that I've done. I mean, I've worked on video games and television, all that, and that's that's a lot more people involved. Um, mm -hmm. That's a that's a that's a much bigger cast, um, uh, and those are all satisfying too. But um, because a comic book creative team is so small, um, and the thing that you do is so specific and kind of instant gratification too i mean we you know we we finished the issue and two months later you guys are reading it um so um so there's just something kind of magic about having everybody on the team doing their thing pulling in the same direction and then you wind up with the book that comes out yeah i like that that analogy of connecting a comic book to just basically any type of sports team because it does feel like if you have that an issue with somebody on the team, that book is not going to be as good as it can be. So I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's it's um, you know everybody everybody has to do their thing, right? I'm a I'm a Mets fan, and you know my guys, mm, not everybody's I'm doing sorry. their thing right now. So uh, so you know if one if one link in that chain isn't working, the whole thing falls apart. Um, and I've I've certainly you know worked on comics where it's not that somebody wasn't good at their job, but they just didn't click with that project or with the team or whatever. And you, and you wind up with something that's not quite what you want it to be. Um, but when, it, when everybody works, when everybody's clicking and when everybody's sort of, you know, when everybody's passing the ball properly, uh, waiting for that backdoor cut, uh, this is great. This is the best thing you can do. 
Right. I, I agree with you. And I, I think I heard you talk before about um, a, a run of Thor that you did that you had um, issues with um, back in the day. Um, but I want to go back to way back before that. Well, not way back before that, a couple of years back um, to when you first got into comic books and, and how you how you got into comic book writing and and, and uh, your introduction into comics as a whole. Like, were you a fan of a certain certain comic book before you started writing or um, just jumped in head first? I was just a fan of comics in general. Um, you know, I went through the I went through the thing that most of us go through, which is you read comics as a kid you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. And then, and then you decide, well, I'm, you know, I'm mature now. I don't need comics. These comics are for kids, you know, you hit 13, 14 or whatever, and you put those aside, which is what happened to me. <clears throat> and then I was a senior in high school and I just kind of rediscovered comics on the, um, on the spinner rack at the local, uh, at the local convenience store. Um, and it was specifically, um, Walt Simonson Thor Ooh. and um, Frank Miller Daredevil that jumped off the rack at me. And I went, oh, these are, this is different than I remember. Mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of got drawn back into it and um, got pretty serious about, you know, pursuing, uh, collect, you know, reading, reading books that I get my hands on, then discovering that there was such a thing as a comic book shop mm -hmm. a few towns over because that, I didn't know that existed when I was a kid. Um, and I started to read independent books like Nexus and American Flag, stuff from First Comics, um, Grendel uh, from Kamiko. Um, and then, you know, not long after I graduated from college, uh, I was working as a journalist at a local newspaper. And um, part of my social group was uh, the comics community in in my area in upstate New York. Um, Jim Starlin, Bernie Wrightson, <clears throat> Terry Austin, Joe Staten, Fred Hembeck, Dan Green, like uh, that whole group that was up here, you know, in the Mid Hudson Valley. And um, and Jim is the one who kind of took me by the hand and said, Hey, do you wanna do you wanna write comics? And you know, my usual my usual line is, well, yeah, it's like somebody asking if you want to play center field for the Yankees. You're like, yeah, I do. But, you know, I, nobody gets a chance to do that. Um, but when Jim Starlin, um, when Jim Starlin says, do you want to write comics? You actually get to write comics. Um, so Jim, Jim is the one who, um, you know, showed me how to do this. Um, Jim is the one who sort of basically said, oh, you can do this. You get it. Like you, you understand how this works. Um, Co-wrote my first few jobs with me at Marvel, um, Silver Surfer jobs specifically. And then um, not long after he left the writing duties on Surfer to pursue uh, the Infinity Gauntlet, which worked out pretty well for everybody involved. Um, made, a, made a few bucks for Marvel along the way. <laughs> Just a little bit of money. A billion dollars as a movie. Uh, <laughs> and uh, somehow Jim convinced them to turn the Monthly Surfer book over to me. Uh, so I have been <clears throat> literally writing comics ever since. Now, were you nervous when you got that chance to take over Silver Surfer? No. Um, I should have been. Uh, <laughs> but I was, you know, I was too excited to be nervous. I was too dumb to be nervous. Um you know, I, I knew it was an opportunity, but I also kind of felt like, well, I can do this. It's, I, you know, I'm, I'm good at this. Um, so I was, yeah, I mean, certainly I should have been nervous. I should have, uh, uh, I should have, uh, I, I didn't realize the kind of opportunity that was in front of me because this seemed like, oh, well, you know, Jim said I should do this. So I'm, so I'm doing this. Yeah. And it just, everything sort of fell in fell into place for me but um in retrospect now that i understand the business more and i understand the opportunity more you know i look at it and just realize oh my god the the sort of you know gold-plated opportunity that was handed to me is is you know just rarer than hen's teeth this is you know this was an amazing because you know because now people you know people strive for 10 years just to get you know a uh, eight page backup in a Marvel or DC anthology. Um, so I, um, 
you know, it, it seemed like, oh, I'm writing for Marvel Comics. That seemed like a natural thing for me at the time. Um, but now I look back at it, and certainly the way the, the industry has changed since then, um, I look back at it and realize that, oh, my God, this was, you know, this was like <clears throat> getting a two-out at bat in the World Series um, in the bottom of the ninth. This was, this was sort of make or break the rest of your life kind of thing. Um, so, I, so ultimately, I mean, thank God I didn't realize what sort of an opportunity it was. I just, <laughs> right. I just did. It's the joys of youth at that point. <laughs> oh, totally. The, the joys and the enthusiasm, um, uh, to just, yeah, I can do, you know, to just, you know, jump out of the plane without a parachute. Yeah. All right. Now we do have a question in our audience, uh, from fish Lee. He says, I have a question for Mr. Mars. What's the best part of getting to write for such amazing characters and what's the worst part? Um, I mean, there honestly is no worst part. This is the best job in the world. Um, uh, the best part, honestly, the best part is I just, I get to make up shit and they pay me for it. Um, <laughs> that's crazy, right? Um, um, you know, this is just, I, I, I don't really have a lot of other job skills, to tell you the truth, right? Like, I, I can write. I can make stuff up. I can tell stories. I guess that's what it really comes down to, is I can tell stories. Um, so, you know, thank God this worked out, because otherwise I'd, you know, probably still be a journalist at a daily newspaper, which is not exactly the, you know, which is not exactly a, a growing industry these days. Um, so, um, so the, you know, the, the best part is just, you know, you get to play with, you either get to invent your own toys, which is awesome, you know, do create your own stuff and, you know, sort of bring into existence a series that, that didn't exist before, uh, you know, characters and concepts and all that that didn't exist. Um, or you get to play with these amazing toys that, um, that, you know, you read about when you were a kid, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm writing silver, I'm writing silver surfer now again. Um, and I can remember, um, picking through a box of old tattered comics that belonged to my older brother in our basement. Um, and the, you know, this, the, the first appearances of first appearance of silver surfer was in that box when I was, I don't know, four or five years old, probably. and didn't really know. Um, didn't really know anything. You know, I, I just knew that the Kirby artwork sort of weirded me out because it was looked like creepy to my five-year-old eyes, but I couldn't look away from it. Um, so, you know, so, all these years later, that that character that 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 I looked at in old comics and didn't really understand, I'm getting to I'm getting to write him. I think I think I've actually written more Silver Surfer stories than anybody else, um, even yeah. Stan, which sort of boggles my mind. So that's awesome. Um, I I uh, you brought up um, playing with toys, and um, it made me think of. Um, Green Lantern 50. So I, I wonder, and you also brought up, uh, you, you started out with Mr. Joe Staten and uh, he's the, he's the creator of Kilowog is that, I believe. And um, I believe you killed one of his, I believe uh, you killed Kilowog there um, <laughs> in that, in that issue. So um, when, when stuff like that happens and you get to play with other people's toys, is that a conversation that you have with him or do you, or you just do it or you uh, ask, ask for forgiveness and, and not <clears throat> listen, or is it, or is it um, something that came from the higher higher ups well it you know it was the, the direction of green lantern when i took it over was um was dictated by uh dc um, okay they you know it wasn't like i came and said you know what we're gonna get rid of hal jordan and i'm gonna make up a new guy how do you like that <laughs> um that's that's not the way that works um if you're gonna do something that drastic to a book it's you know it either comes from above or you get you know you, there's a bunch of meetings and you get permission um, in that particular case, um, you know, DC, DC, um, offered me the book. I dawdled for a week or two to decide whether I wanted to do it. Um, I finally said yes. And, um, and then we were off and running cause we didn't have a whole lot of time. Um, the, the, the previous, the previous direction had already been solicited. So DC had to, you know, cancel those solicitations and do the new one with, with the new creative team. Um, 
So in the case of Emerald Twilight, DC gave me a couple pages of outline of like, here's what here's what we want this story to be. Um, it wasn't really dictated, but it was like, here's here's the general um, here's the general flow of things that need to happen for us to get to you know the point where we're going to launch a new Green Lantern. Um, so um, so Kilowog in particular wasn't mentioned in any in any way. It wasn't mentioned in detail, but I felt like if if um if this you know sort of the fall of hal jordan was going to mean something uh and his sort of descent into madness was going to uh resonate that you know you know i think in the in the outline it just said you know how how destroys the green lantern core you know mm. so how that actually happened was up to me and and i felt like well it's you know if we're going to do this it's got to hurt you know it yeah. needs to it needs to be um, it needs to be a tragedy. So I thought Kilowog was the, you know, if, if somebody was going to get wiped out on camera, it needed to be Kilowog because he had, you know, he had fans. He's sort of a beloved character. Um, emotionally, you needed to feel it. You needed to hurt. So I was, it was my decision to pick him and, and show him getting blown away on, on panel. I love it. But, I, that... but I didn't, but I, I didn't ask Joe and he didn't yell at me when I saw him. So. <laughs> okay, that's that's good. <laughs> um, I, I I'm curious though because I know that that was one of those decisions that was that the fans you know were not as happy about you know oh, at the time. I wasn't when I read it, <laughs> but but now like it's one of my favorite Green Lantern stories. Like you know that's is is there a I don't know like a a, a satisfaction in knowing you know years later that you wrote something that was truly impactful. And that you know added to the Green Lantern lore, or you're like, you know, the fans were just, you know, the fans were just wrong back then, or or how does it, how does that feel? You know, the fans, the fans aren't aren't really ever wrong. Um, you feel how you feel, um, and that's that's completely valid. Um, we knew we were going to upset people. Um, there was, you know, and that was that was part of it. We knew we were going to get a lot of buzz by by changing something in a comic. You know. The, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the sort of the classic, um, the classic reaction that you know you expect from fans is you know the fans say, you know, uh, nothing ever changes; it's the same all the time. Why don't you change something? And then when you change something, everybody goes, well, "What the hell? Why'd you change that?" Um, you know, and 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 you also understand that the vast, but you know, you never hear from the vast majority of fans, right? It's it's. It's the, it's the, um, it's the, it's just like politics, right? It's the extreme end of either side of the spectrum. So the, the rabid Hal fans that wanted me fired and, you know, started a group to get me, you know, to make sure I couldn't feed my family. Um, you know, we heard a lot from them and we heard a lot from people who love the new direction. You know, everybody in the middle who was just like, let me read this story and see what happens. You know, people read the comic and move on with their lives. Yeah. Um, so you can't take, um, you can't take the, the really vociferous reactions from, um, from the hardcore fans either way, um, as representative of, of the whole. Um, but, you know, certainly we knew that this was going to be a significant story in terms of, of reaction, because this isn't the sort of thing that, that was done very often. Um, obviously we, the, the death of Superman was a big deal story, sold a lot of comics, but eventually, you know, we were just back to business as usual. And the same thing with breaking up Batman. Um, Batman, Batman's back got broken and he got better. Uh, um, you know, both of those storylines were a big deal for DC. Um, big sort of landmarks in comics um, where somebody else took over the, the main role in the book. This Emerald Twilight was very much the next kind of story in that vein because DC realized that there was, you know, there was interest and frankly sales and that sort of stuff. Um, but this one was going to be permanent. This was going to be, you know, we're not going to bring the main character back. We're going to do a completely new direction. Um, and that was predicated largely upon the fact that the sales of the Green Lantern franchise were, uh, were pretty middling at the time. Um, very much split across a number of different books, but just none of the books were selling um, in in the fashion that um, they should have been, or that they were, you know, editorial wanted them to. 
So, um, so the decision was made to, all right, we're going to, you know, we're going to upset the apple cart and we're not putting the apples back on the cart. We're just going to, you know, make a new cart. Right. Now, I mean, now you've of course written for DC, you've written for Marvel image, I think dark horse also, um, out of all these places, is there still a character that you have not written that you want to? Um, my usual answer for this is Tarzan. Um, even though I have actually written Tarzan, but I, you know, I think if I, if I get one answer, it's I'd like to do a Tarzan monthly book just because there's such a, um, I grew up on those stories. I grew up on the Edgar Rice Burroughs novels, um, as well as the, you know, the Johnny Weissmuller movies when I was, you know, six or seven years old out on, on, on Sunday mornings on channel two out of New York. Um, so, um, I always love those stories and I love the fact that the, the novels at least were sort of much more fantasy science fiction stories than just, you know, guy running around the jungle, you know, lost Roman cities and, you know, dinosaurs in the earth's core and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the fact that, that Tarzan in comics has such a, um, has such an amazing pedigree. Um, you know, the Russ Manning stuff that was, Printed by uh, Gold Key and Joe Kubert at DC, John Buscema at Marvel. Um, so that's my usual answer. Um, I also realize that you know Tarzan is a very pulp hero, and probably not um, you know not very in fashion these days. Um, so um, beyond Tarzan, the one hero that I've I've wanted to write in some form or fashion haven't really had much of a chance is Doctor Fate. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I've always loved Dr. Fate. I got to mash them together with Dr. Strange for the Amalgam books, which is one of my favorite projects ever, but I've never had, uh, uh, maybe I've thrown a line or two to Dr. Fate in a crossover somewhere, but, but I've always liked, um, uh, I've always liked the, um, I've always liked that, uh, the helmet and the, the Egyptian background and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but you know, virtually any character you put your hands on, you can, you can, you can, I, I've at least been able to figure out a way that, oh, this, here's, here's my way in and here's how I'm interested in this. Um, I, I, I subscribe to the, to the um, point of view that there really aren't many bad characters. There's just some characters you haven't figured out yet. Yeah. I love that. Um, <laughs> when, when you were talking about the best and worst parts of, of comic book, uh, making comic books, uh, my mind, I thought you were going to say social media, but I, I remember hearing you uh, talk about uh, kind of alluding to your social media being a garden, you know, that you have to, uh, <laughs> that you got to kind of tailor to what you want to see. And um, I think that approach is, is is very good, especially especially today when there's, you know, every like everybody has a platform and and, you know, like you just said, the loudest people want to be heard and. Um, you don't want to stretch yourself out with it, you know, because it's because it's not necessarily you don't need it. You don't need social media. I mean, some some of us need it, you know, to sell books. But at the same time, um, you know, if if I got to deal with with negativity all the time, you know, it kind of doesn't make it worth it. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, my Twitter feed or Instagram or whatever. That's uh, like you said, that's my garden. That's my house. And like, I don't you know, I don't let people come into my yard or my house and, and poop on the floor. Right. That's not, that's not how this works. Um, so if you're going to try to do that, you know, out you go, there's a one strike rule. You don't get three strikes. You just get one. Um, <laughs> um, and, and look, there are people who, who, you know, who just want to cause trouble who, you know, who are, um, you know, for whatever reasons, like everybody's got, you know, everybody's got their baggage. Um, but there are people who just who just show up to to antagonize or um, see if they can get a reaction or whatever. And you know, like you said, it's it's a garden. Um, when the weeds spring up, you got to pull them out, or they continue to spread. Um, and certainly, I I do a lot of weeding. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, last week I did a lot of weeding because I got a bunch of you know. Uh, well, they they were self proclaimed Punisher fans, um, but I suspect most of them have never read a Punisher book in their life. Um, they just were 
coming in to throw rocks. So, yeah. you know, as soon as I see you, you're gone. Cause that's, you know, I, I enjoy social media because it connects, you know, it connects me to, <clears throat> well, to you guys, to, to anybody that, you know, we have a, a common interest. We are all of the same tribe. Um, I was talking about this at, in a, I was at a show in New Mexico last weekend and, you know, doesn't matter where you go or where I've been able to go in, um, in the world. I was in Alaska and then a, a week later I was in Abu Dhabi and then I was in Albuquerque, which I guess I'm just visiting places that begin with a, um, so, uh, Ron will be in Alaska pretty soon. Then Argentina. Uh, yeah, actually I need to get to Argentina. Um, you know, but it's, it's your, you're in these disparate places in the world and you meet people that love what we love, right? That, that, you know, love comics, love this, this sort of genre material that we do in comics and they are of your tribe, even though you don't even speak the same, same language. Um, or at least you didn't learn the same language, frankly. Everybody in Abu Dhabi speaks English. Um, um, so it's I just find that to be one of the delights of of doing this for for a living is that you, you know, you are able to go around the world and you have a sh you have shorthand with somebody that you've never even met before that has that's grown up completely differently than you have, um, but because you love the same things, you are you know you are brothers already. Now, the past couple months has been, got to have been pretty exciting for you. I mean, you have the launch of the Fireflies TV series, Diablo 4, that you worked on also. And like you mentioned, you're coming out with a new Silver Surfer uh, book. How are you able to balance all of these projects going on, which seems like almost all at the same time? I don't sleep a lot. Okay, that makes <laughs> that's, sense. That's the unfortunate truth is, you know, I, I uh, you know, I work for, I work for Blizzard. Um and then when when that work is done, I start working on comics. And you know, and when that work is done, I start working on, you know, the, being a script consultant for a TV show or whatever. Um, it's you know, it doesn't leave a lot of free time, um, other than you know, sneaking out to play softball and play golf and stuff like that. Um, but I I like everything that I do. You know, I I would I would I'd like a little bit more time to read. And a little bit more time to watch movies, but other than that, you know, I'm not a not a homebody sitting on the couch, uh, just watching endless hours of of, uh, of TV. Um, I like to be busy, so I am busy. Um, and certainly, there are days when I go, "Oh man, I really do just want to sit on the couch." Um, today being one of those days, right? Uh, but um, but I've got stuff to do. The next. Uh, the next issue of uh, Silver Surfer needs to be written. Um, and I'm part way into it and I've got some editing to do and um, there's a couple projects that I'm working on that I can't tell you about because they're not announced yet. Um, no, you so, can tell us. It's okay. It's okay. So it's you can a, tell us. Yeah, oddly, I might get a phone call from somebody that said, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, you dummy, shut up. Um, um so um, it's particularly when you, particularly as a writer in this business, um, it's a constant state of juggling. You're working on different things at different times. Um, and, and you're also, you know, stuff just happens where, you know, a, an idea occurs to you, a series or, or a story occurs to you and you're just like, oh, well, shit, I gotta, I gotta go pursue this now because this thing is stuck in my head. Um, so I'm actually working on a on a um, on a story, you know, a series with an artist that I've worked with before, and we're kind of smacking together the characters and the general story outline and all that kind of stuff, trading things back and forth. So it's um, yeah, I, th I think I think when you're a writer, you, the the nature of it is juggling. Um, less so when you're an artist because you you know the 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 intensity of the time you know you have to get that page done today and you got to get tomorrow's page done tomorrow you don't have a lot of time to juggle things so you're kind of working on one thing at a time um but the nature of you know the nature of it being a writer is is you know you're constantly doing it and um and stuff occurs to you when 
you know, when I'm taking a shower or taking a walk around the lake that we live on or, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the universe feeds you, you know, that you, the ideas come, um, thankfully, uh, they still come. So I, you know, I've, I've never gone, Oh, I, I don't have any ideas. I'm, I'm all full. I'm, uh, I guess I'm all empty. Um, so, um, you just have to, you just have to run with it. It's, uh, you know, I, I guess in some ways it's, it's a little bit of a curse, but, um, um, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. That artist isn't uh, Daryl Banks, is it? Because I, I saw him last weekend, and he was he was saying something similar. He said he had a project that he was working on with a, a writer that he worked with in the past, and they were throwing back and forth ideas. So I uh, can neither confirm nor deny nothing. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Because uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell us what project he was working on either. And now, now I'm hearing it a second time. I don't know. Well, uh, I'm, re you know, I, I really can confirm or deny nothing. Um, but uh, um, part of this is that you, you know, you find artists that you click with because the artist is really your co-author. The artist is, yeah, you know, Danny, write... the artist is a co-author, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm an artist on his book, so I'll just <laughs> Look, treat your treat your treat your artists like gold, my friend. Because uh, you know, I you know I do some I do some teaching too. I do I teach uh, you know some online courses for writing comics for the Jacob Kruger Studio in uh, Manhattan. And um, one of the I, the thing I try to drill into all of the writers' brains is like, look, you you know, there, without the artist, there's no comic. So uh, right. nobody wants to read our scripts. That's, you know, nobody shows, no, nobody shows up to a restaurant to read a recipe. All right. Our Ooh, scripts are basically recipes. Um, people go to a restaurant for the meal. The meal is the finished product. Um, and you can't have a meal without, without the artist. Um, so, um, so what I was going to say is that the, um, you know, I can write the same script and hand it to three different artists and I wind up with three different stories because mm -hmm. it's it's how it's interpreted. It's where it's what they bring to the story that makes it differently. Um, uh, writers who feel like the artist is just the, you know, the vehicle for them to express their story are sorely mistaken. Um, you know, and I and, you know, writers who, you know, get a page back and go, oh, well, this isn't how I was picturing it in my head. Well, if you wanted it how you pictured it in your head, you should draw it yourself. You should have drew it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and, exactly. um, and the, you know, and then the answer is always, oh, well, I can't draw. And there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I think I want to say it was you that I heard. your own question, you know. I want to say it was you that I heard saying something about um, listing uh, that, that comic book should list the artist's name first in, in comics and then you know the rest of the team behind it because uh, the the art is is such such an important part of it is it is comics um was that you or am i am i giving um, could have been i mean i i i don't i don't disagree with that um the artist is the one who makes the story um i can you know if i write a you know shakespearean level script and they hand it to a lousy artist at the end of the day that's a lousy story um, cause it just doesn't work. Um, conversely, if I write a fairly middling story and they hand it to a genius, you know, they hand it to Garcia Lopez and Kevin Nolan. Um, that's a pretty damn good story at the end of the day. Make it work. Um, oh, yeah. You, <clears throat> you, um, you ride the coattails of the people that draw your story. Um, that's the reality of, uh, that's the reality of comics. Um, and if you don't like that reality, um, go write something else, go write prose or, you know, one act plays or whatever. Um, but the, 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 um, the artistic collaboration is why you do this. Um, if you're not interested in that collaboration, don't write comics. Cause that's, that's what this is entirely about. I love this 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 wealth of love towards artists on this show. I think we should have Ron on every week just to hear him say how much he loves artists. Just I love this. 
I, 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 and I agree with you. I, they are, they're joke, they're picking on me because I do have the conversation a lot. Artist versus writer, you know, it's it's a conversation. But I do agree that without art, there there are no comic books. So, um, I'll 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 give it to you. See, Javon Stokes in the in the comments, uh, he's he's a, a big proponent of that also. But he's an artist, so I just I'd like to give him a hard time. Uh, and Kyron also. But yes, I 100% I agree with you. So yeah, it's, do want, it's oh. the, you know, like like you said, you know, with no without an artist, there's there's no comic. Um, without a writer, there's still pictures on a page that tell a story. Um, you know, so so that seems to me that that by that definition, the artists are more important. You know, they don't need us, right? We need them. They go. might need us to help tell a better story or to, you know, to, to polish the story or, or, you know, collaborate on the story. But ultimately, an artist can can do this job um, by themselves. And there we go. Yeah, Danny, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to make my own comics. <laughs> I knew you didn't need me from the, from the very beginning, to be honest with you. <laughs> I just want to let you know that. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. So, I mean. All right, so we, we've talked about your past. Um, we talked about what you're working on, but I definitely want to get into a little bit uh, before the show ends about your future. Um, we know you're coming out with the Silver Surfer Rebirth Legacy Series. Can you give us any information on that series, what it's about, things like that? Because I'm, I'm very <laughs> um, interested as a Silver Surfer fan. It's about five issues, and it's about Silver Surfer. Um, I Some of it I can't tell you because some of it sort of springs out of the end of of the warlock series that we're currently doing right now that well we're not doing it right now we're done with it but the issues are still kind of, i think issue three comes out this coming week yeah. and um uh and i the four and five are done and in the can so off to press um so um this really picks up from the end of uh you know it can stand alone if you didn't read the warlock book but I hope you go back and read the warlock book um but um it will have uh will have surfer in it obviously it will have janice vell it will have um thanos in it i think that's a fairly obvious thing since we just revealed the the ron Lim uh variant cover which has thanos and captain marvel on it um the the marvel captain marvel um <clears throat> so other than that i don't i don't think we're we're revealing too much um yet um it's gonna it's gonna involve some time travel um and i i'm i'm getting to play with some different um different realities that uh maybe not even real different time frames that um you might have seen in marvel comics here and there um, so in a um and in a larger sense this will this will the first surfer series that we did the warlock that's currently running now and the current surfer series um are sort of thematically linked um you could sit down and read them all in one shot and it would make sense as a as a whole as a as a larger story arc okay which which uh, to, be on, to be to be perfectly honest we didn't know when we did the uh, surfer rebirth that there was going to be more but it was it was you know it was successful enough and popular enough that marvel came to us and went hey you guys are up for doing another one right <laughs> okay you can you can sort of tie this into a bigger story arc right uh, okay <laughs> thinking shit i shouldn't have tied off all the loose ends and surfer um, um but Wait, marvel it, didn't I, think putting ron mars and ron Lim on a silver surfer series would be successful Come well, I, I don't think I don't think it's that they didn't think it would be successful. This is just you never know. You put this stuff out into the market and you see what happens. Um, Why well, buy like two hundred copies myself? So that's okay. Well, awesome. You're the one keeping us going then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think, and you know, hopefully that you know people are people are enjoying seeing us together again. But hopefully beyond that, it's it's also a sense that they're getting a you know they're getting a solid story that looks great. Um, every month we're having a ball doing it and um uh you know working with ron is just you know as as we said when we started it's just like you know putting on an old pair of jeans and a hoodie that fit just right uh they you know they they feel good 
Well, we do have one more question in our audience here. Javon says, do you, for, do you favor cosmic stories more? Not particularly. Um, it's not like I, you know, got into this and went, you know, oh, I, I must tell cosmic stories. Um, I just like telling stories. Um, and, you know, whether it's cosmic stories or street level stuff like Batman and Daredevil or mystery or horror or science fiction or historical fiction. I mean, I like all that stuff. I like, I like everything that's on the buffet table. Um, I don't want to eat just one dish. Um, cosmic stuff is cool and I love doing it and I would certainly hope to do more. Um, we've, uh, we're putting out, uh, Andy, Andy Lanning and I, who co-writes with me sometimes, um, put out a, um, Pro, a crowdfunded project on Zoop called uh, Resolution, which is um, headed off to press now, uh, finally. Um, and, you know, that's very much a cosmic, you know, it's sort of Green Lantern core meets Unforgiven kind of story. Um, so when we, you know, when we had a, we when we had an opportunity to just make something up, um, we ended up making up a cosmic story because we both like that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but the next time, you know, the, the project that I mentioned earlier with, with an artist buddy, um, is, has science fiction tones and it's, but it's set in the past and it's got some weird interdimensional stuff. So it's, you know, I just tell stories. I don't sit down to say, oh, you know, I'm going to think of a cosmic story now. Um, it's, um, it's like working different muscles. You know, you go to the, you go to the gym and you do your pull day and then you do your push day and then you do leg day. I mean, you work, you work all of that stuff. And that's how I look at the writing is it's, I, I don't want to do just one kind of story. I don't, I don't just want to do um, superhero stories. Even I want to do everything across the board because that, you know, that allows me to stretch myself as a writer. Excellent. Um, so now, uh, now it's time for my favorite part of the show. Uh, quick takes. So uh, if you have never seen the show before, quick takes is a rapid fire Q&A session with our guest where we will give you 45 seconds to uh, to answer five questions or consecutively 45 seconds each. And um, we'll get started as soon as Kyron is ready. <laughs> Mm hmm. Uh, the production has gone up since we got sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> New, no. <laughs> um, That's right. just the same as always been, dude. <laughs> it's, just, it's the same, but it felt better. It felt oh. better this time. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, question number one. Um, we got forty-five seconds on the clock, and I would like to hear your thoughts on uh, which is more important: inspiration or consistency when it comes to making comic books. You need both, um, but inspiration is not worth a damn unless you're consistently putting your ass in the chair and doing the work. I agree. I agree. I love it. That was that only took you ten seconds. Yeah, um, I mean, look, ideas, ideas are great, but they're a dime a dozen. Um, it's what you do with the idea that matters. Agreed. Agreed. I love that answer. Okay, question number two. Um, I want to say I heard you talking about um, the changing of, of markets for comics. Um, I want to know what do you see as the future uh, in comics? Do you do you see it as Kickstarter or crowdfunding websites like Zoop, or do you uh, think the direct market is still the way to go? There's no there's no one future. Um, you know, the comics has become increasingly diverse and is um, both in terms of the creators uh, telling the stories the readers consuming the stories and how we're getting those stories out. So I think that's really the future of comics is all of it. Um, crowdfunding, direct market, um, not so much the newsstand because that's not really a viable way to do these things as monthlies, um, but very much, um, you know, big box stores, Barnes and Noble, that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to tell all kinds of stories across all sorts of formats. I agree. I love it. Okay. Um, there's a, uh, I I grew up in a in a time where Ninja Turtles was the biggest thing, you know, um, Batman, Superman, of course, 
and then of course anime you know drag Z and all that stuff and i'm still nostalgic about that stuff now i think you know a lot of people as you grow up you still love the things that you first fell in love with and, you know the stuff that happens after that is you know whatever but uh now we're in a, a time where people are like especially movies are are really banking on nostalgia so i want to know your your perspective on uh the comics comic books and if we should lean on nostalgia from our past or try to find the next big thing um it should be both really um you know <clears throat> look like I, i'm a generation ahead of you guys right so ninja turtles doesn't mean a damn thing to me either does transformers or gi joe because like i was you know i was in high school when that stuff came out so i was you know going to cakers and chasing girls um so nostalgia is a powerful thing you know i love the stuff that i discovered at 10 11 12 years old um but it's not the only thing right we need to be producing new material now as well so that the kids who are 11 and 12 right now can look back in 20 years and and fall in love with that stuff um we so we need to be doing both we need to you know give that nostalgia audience what it wants but also do new things so that um so that we're feeding the next generation coming in love it absolutely okay question number four um which and i know i already know the answer to this now that i'm now that i'm about to ask it but yeah, i don't know why you gave me this question <laughs> okay i'll i'll ask the, i'll ask i'll ask it differently i was going to ask which one is better but i'll say um what is the difference in the process of making video games and comic books what's the biggest difference between the two um the time is very different um you know diablo 4 just came out i've been i've been working on it personally for two years um people on the team have been working on it for five six seven years um so uh it, it is a long long gestation process um very different from comics and also comics is a handful of people making the thing and putting it out video games you know i worked on diablo with 600 of my closest friends uh yeah. most of whom i've never met uh so it's it's a huge number of people all pulling together in the same direction to make a thing um and you know and then it it ends up being a worldwide phenomenon because it's 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 something that um the audience has been waiting for for years it's huge it's huge okay so question number five and this is the final one um as most of the people in the audience know i do another show called top five live where we uh we uh come up with a different top five list off the top well not off the top of our heads um but for every week so what i like to do on this show is ask our guests a uh, top five list off the top of their heads and this week i want to ask you what are your top five favorite characters that you've ever written for oh wow <clears throat> um let's see uh I, I guess i have to say silver surfer and green lantern because they were so good to me um witchblade because she was so good Ooh. to me uh superman uh because it doesn't get any better than superman um and uh probably darth vader just because i you know sort of to go back to the nostalgia thing that's you know i grew up on star wars i discovered star wars at just the right age the fact that i you know years later would get to put put words in darth vader's mouth still boggles my mind i love that i love that answer um and i was telling i don't know who it was i was telling <laughs> but witchblade is one of those those iconic characters too it's like even if you even for people who don't who've never read Witchblade before, they know who she is. Like they know, <laughs> you know Witchblade when you see her, so. Yeah, I, you know, I I think I've probably written more Witchblade stories than, definitely than Silver Surfer stories. Um, and probably more than Green Lantern stories. Um, I wrote Witchblade for, you know, basically 10 years with a little bit of a break in between. So, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and that wasn't, you know, it, it was just because I found it to be a really good fit. I found it that, the, the series to be a place where I could do any sort of uh, any sort of story I wanted to because of the nature of the concept. Mm -hmm. I could do uh, horror, detective, police procedural, um, science fiction, superhero. Like I could do any kind of story I wanted. Um, so I never got bored doing the book because I could just go in any direction that I felt like. And it sounds like it. 
and to their credit, Top Cow gave me the ability to go in, in, in any direction that I wanted. Sort of sounds like it allowed you to, like you said earlier, work those writer muscles, do different things on the same series. Yeah, absolutely. It's and and I know that that's not you know that that's not ev how every writer approaches what they do. There are a lot of writers that sort of have a lane and they want to stay in it. You know, I, I just want to write horror stories or I just want to write the superheroes that I grew up reading, um, which is totally cool. And that's a valid way to approach your career <clears throat> and your and your creativity. But it's just not one that I subscribe to. Nice. Well, if you have a couple more minutes, we have two more questions from our audience. Uh, Javon says, did you enjoy your time at CrossGen? Um, yeah, till the end, till it, you know, till it swirled around the bowl and was gone. Um, <laughs> but generally, you know, it was a, it was a huge learning experience for me um, uh, in terms of, you know, better understanding the, um, the comic pro the comic making process start to finish not just my end of it but seeing what seeing how the pencilers approach their their particular part of it and the inkers and the colorists and lettering and production like all of that stuff we were re we were responsible for our own books there were no editors so the, the writers basically kind of led the creative teams and supervised um what was going on so I learned a huge amount about making comics, um, made a lot of friendships or continued a lot of friendships from the people that I was, um, that I was already, you know, uh, already had a relationship with that came there. Um, and I think we made some good comics. Um, I think we made uh, some really good non-superhero comics, um, which were not that common in the industry at that point. Um, the industry was starting to change and offer a wider variety of material, but you know, it was still by and large, there was a lot of superhero stuff in those days. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I liked being, I liked being in the same place with the people I was creating with. Um, I like being able to, you know, sit down and, you know, shoot the shit with the creative team on Cyan or, or the path. Um, and, you know, kick around ideas and come up with stuff that we wanted to do. Um, it was, you know, it was a very fertile, creative uh, place. Um, business wise, and some of the, you know, some of the practices of, you know, <clears throat> that that eventually went away, like, you know, being at nine, you know, working eight hour a day, and, you know, it's just, that's not how this job works. It, you know, you sort of, as long as the book gets done, it doesn't matter when anybody's showing up in the studio. Um, so, um, you know, there were there were drawbacks and and uh, failures on the business side of things, which is one of the reasons it's not here anymore. Um, but overall, it was a very positive experience. Um, I'm I, I remain very regretful that a lot of people, myself included, got, you know, sort of left holding the bag financially for work that we were owed. Um, but, you know, that's a those are the pitfalls that you have at any publisher at times. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, uh, overall, uh, overall, it was good. Um, overall, I would not change it. Okay. All right. And last question looks like, uh, from Dan Bethel, how would you say the writing of comics has changed over time and how has it been adjusting to, or creating that change? Um, I think, com you know, uh, comics are certainly, um, we take longer to tell stories now. Um, you know, the kind of thing that, you know, when Stan and Jack did the coming of Galactus and three issues of, uh, of Fantastic Four, you know, that would be like a 20 issue maxi series now. Um, so I think um, I think in some ways we've probably gone a little bit too far in one direction in terms of, of you know, letting stories go longer than they need to. Um, uh, so but again, that's, you know, when you tell when you're suddenly telling a lot more kinds of stories from a lot more kinds of creators um the way you tell those stories is going to change the way the way those stories are are put in front of the audiences are going to have differences um you know we're you know it's not just superheroes beating the hell out of each other um every month we're doing all sorts of stories so that demands that you tell those stories in different fashions um i to me the the, the through line that that any comic story needs to have is that these are this is visual storytelling um give 
give the artist something cool to draw as often as possible. And get, therefore you are giving the reader something cool to look at as often as possible. Um, you know, there are certainly times when it's, you know, it's, it's two people, you know, sitting at a coffee table, um, you know, having the discussion. So the part of the, you know, part of the job is to figure out, all right, well, how do we, how do we make that visual? How do we make that more interesting to look at? And that doesn't mean that there's, you know, <clears throat> that there's a, you know, there's a fire next door and, you know, fire trucks are coming in and, you know, you're, you're adding, you're adding action to a sequence. that doesn't, doesn't need it. It's a question of, all right, how do I, how do I make this intimate scene of two characters talking uh, the most visually interesting way to do that? Like what, what bits of business do I get them to do? Where does the, you know, in, in terms of working with the artist, like where does the camera go? How do we, how do we play this scene? Um, to me, that's always, that's always the job, no matter what kind of story you're telling. Um, and it can be, you know, um, Galactus eating Manhattan, or it can be, um, it can be, you know, two people sitting at the end of a dock having a, uh, having a serious conversation. Um, just figure out, figure out the best way to tell that story visually. Um, and, and then, you know, and then work with the artist to, to lean into that, to, to, get something in front of the audience that's um that's visually exciting rather than just a bunch of headshots all right danny do you have any other questions for ron before we let him go oh, i i got them all in i and we appreciate it sir we appreciate you uh being with us and and uh <laughs> we appreciate your work over the years for sure well thanks guys it's a it's a pleasure i appreciate uh you letting me drink my coffee because otherwise i probably wouldn't have been as coherent uh, well, before we let you go, I have one more question. Sure. Um, and hopefully it's a quick one for you. But uh, a lot of our audience are people who are making comics as a side hustle or hobby, or they're trying to make comics as a career somehow. Um, do you have any advice for anybody, whether they're, they're an artist, writer, colorist, or anything like that? The short version is make comics. Um, the best way to learn how to make comics is to make comics. Um, and I tell people that, you know, that, that I've, uh, that have taken my my uh, class, my online class with uh, Jake Kruger Studio. The the best way to learn how to make comics is to make comics. Um, and your first one's going to suck, and your second one's going to suck a little less because you've learned the lessons that you took away from the first one, and your third one will suck less than your second one. Um, you you learn by doing in this business because there, like I said before, there's a, there's a kind of alchemy to this. Um, and you'll finish your first story and then you'll take a step back and look at it maybe a month or two later and you'll you'll look back at it and you'll see all the stuff you could have done better you'll see all the stuff that you, you that you were you, that you would like to fix now um that means you learned something that means you learned from doing the process um so i think that you know again make comics um bite off um bite off a meal that you can chew um don't decide well you know i'm gonna do a 24 issue maxi series of this cosmic empire and here's the you know here's the 57 page story bible with all the characters like nobody's look nobody wants that shit. like from a from a uh from a a new um from new creators who are just figuring out what they're doing just making their name go make an eight or a ten page story like nice. do something short do something that you can get your arms around. Um, Let's see if and, PJ is still in the if PJ is still in the audience. I want to make sure he heard that. And PJ sent me about a hundred page uh, uh, document that he was that he was starting with. I'm like, let's start small. Do do yeah. something. <laughs> do something small first. Like that's that's ambitious, but also when you have like a hundred page document, that means you're not actually making the story, right? Mm -hmm. That means you're you know. You're, you're doing research, you're doing background, you're doing everything except making the story. Um, you know, that's, that's the equivalent of standing at the, standing on the end of the diving board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're sort of near the pool, but you ain't in it. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta get in the pool. Um, so all of that stuff is, is okay, but it's a distraction from actually doing the work. Uh, and the work is making the story. Um, so, make your eight or 10 page story and get it finished. Um, 
having having 15 different series in progress and none of them finish means you got zero like that means you got nothing um make a thing and finish a thing and then move on to the next one um there's uh there's great value in having a finished story even if it's bad even if it's your first one and you don't know what you're doing and you're just kind of figuring it out um you know having something that's finished one allows you to put it out into the world right you, you put it out into the world because of this thing that we're on right now right what <clears throat> when i broke into comics this didn't exist mm-hmm. like when i broke into comics you you worked for one of the small publishers or marvel or dc or you didn't work in comics or or you made it you know you made a comic and then you know ran it out on a uh, xerox machine you know at school when nobody was looking um <clears throat> you know now you can make you can make a comic and the next one the day after it's finished you can put it in front of the world um and just you know sort of beat the bushes and let everybody know that it's there <clears throat> and then you can make another one and you can make another one um it's um it, it has democratized the process hugely um and so when i started you 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 know you tried to get picked up by a publisher and hopefully get your work out there now that's that's you know sort of the, that's sort of towards the end of the process is getting picked up by, by a publisher um the beginning of the process is just make the thing and put it out and um and you know there are plenty of people making a living um on self-publishing their own stuff uh online um or on one of the online platforms um they're you know their end all and be all is not writing for marvel or dc or drawing for marvel or dc they just want to do their own thing and and the 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 medium has evolved to the point where you can do that um you can put stuff uh online or you put it on webtoons or comiXology or whatever comiXology has turned into um and just get your material out there um that's the main thing is is make the thing and put it out um, and not everybody's going to like it, and that's okay. Um, the main person, um, the main person that has to like what you do is you. If you are satisfied with your story, um, that's that's most of the job right there. If you feel like you did the best job you could do at this time, that's what matters. I, you know, I still tell stories that I want to read. I don't sit here and go, oh man, I wonder, you know. I wonder what the the long term Silver Surfer audience would would like now. I mean, that's just not how I approach the job. I frankly, I don't really care what you guys want. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's the truth. Is I, you know, uh, and and believe me, I'm, you know, I live this life because I've people have responded to my work, and it's and it's wonderful, and I'm and I'm extremely thankful for it. Um, but I don't. I don't know what you want. I don't know what your tastes are. The only person whose tastes I know and whose whose um, uh, whose uh, whose sensibilities I can appeal to is me. So, so thirty years into doing this, I still write stories for me. I write the story that I think I would like to read, and then hopefully the rest of the audience comes along for the ride. Um, everybody should to me that's the best way to approach this stuff is is do the thing that that appeals to you that you are passionate about and then um hope everybody comes along for the ride and if they do great and if they don't at least you made the story that you wanted to make and then you can do it again and see what happens the next time um it's this is a wonderful way to tell stories um but it's it's a it's still a very personal way to tell stories tell the stories that matter to you um rather than the stories that you think will appeal to people. There you go. All right, Ron. Well, this is the end of our show. Um, like Danny said earlier, we appreciate you being on. Um, this has been a fun show. Like a lot of our guests said, this has probably been a great show. Um, but we want to make sure people get you, get to know you better. So where can people maybe check out you online, on social media, or even your website that we can keep up with you? Uh, website is ronmars.com. Um mm-hmm. It's newly refurbished, so it looks a lot better and sleeker and has appearances and all that kind of stuff on it. Um, thanks to my buddy Truman, who refurbished my website. Um, so ronmars.com is the website. Uh, at ronmars is the Twitter account, which is where the updates and all that kind of stuff are. 
you know, concert pictures from The Cure the other night and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> um, and there's an Instagram account too, but I don't, I don't generally maintain that as much as I should. So uh, the main one for the, for the, uh, you know, updates of what, what's, what's the latest and what's coming is uh, the Twitter, uh, d- despite the hellscape that Twitter was turning into, um, you know, weed that garden, man, um, is uh, at Ron Mars. All right. Uh, Danny, where can people check out your work? Um, y'all know me. If you want to find me, our, our website is fourthwallpros.com. And um, if you want to find me on social media, it's at the Ace Blade on all social media platforms. Kyron, where can people find you? Oh, uh, you can find me at tourscomics.com. Um, check out all my issues with we have Saw the Lightning Wilder coming out soon. I know people have asked me about the Kickstarter for that. I'm actually going to push that out to the end of July just because I have a lot of other things going. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry to disappoint you so much, Danny. Uh, but end of July, mid to end July, we're going to have the Kickstarter for that. Um, and, of course, you can check out Taurus Comics on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Taurus Comics. But if this is your first time checking out our podcast, you can go back and listen to previous podcasts at fourtalespodcast.com. That is the number four, T-A-L-E-S, podcast.com. Listen to all past 70, what I say? This was episode 78, 79. So go listen to the other 78 episodes, please. Listen in and uh, come back next week where we're going to have the amazing Javon Stokes, you know, friend of the show there, back on the show again. I don't know why he keeps coming back, but he does. But he's going to be on the show again. We're going to talk about, I'm assuming, heat or strong or something else that he might have coming up. And uh, after that, we're going to take a little bit of a break for two weeks. Danny said he doesn't want to do a show without me. So we're going to take a two week break, a little bit of hiatus, and we'll come back strong. Might do some pre-recorded stuff. Maybe we'll see. OK, I'll see what I can whip together. But again, um, everybody, thank you for showing up. <laughs> thank you for being on Ron Mars. Thank you for being on uh, on the show. This has been a great. But until next time, sayonara, goodbye, and please take care of yourselves. Thanks, guys. I wanna know what it is Quick is trying to say